Hello, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Diana Flato, Assistant Curator at America's Society Visual Arts. Um, we're here waiting for Diego Saksuma. He's going to be joining us in a second. Is it? This is part of our series in the studio. Um, as soon as Diego joins us, and here he is. Um, so we'll be having a conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm here obviously remotely in my apartment in Brooklyn and Diego is in Guatemala City. This is um, I think our sixth or seventh uh, studio visit that we're doing as part of a series during these strange times we're in. They're all available afterwards if you miss any of them live on YouTube and on our website. Um, thanks again for coming to speak with us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah. So one of the reasons, oh, and we have a visitor from yeah, yeah. Maybe, um, maybe he, mine will appear he crashed too. early. <laughs> um, so one of the reasons that your work is so interesting during this time, and we talked about this before, is a lot of your photography doesn't have people in it. So yeah. somebody looking at your Instagram feed might compare it to the quarantine we're in or these accounts that are popping up. Um, but actually, you're dealing with people and their relationship to the city. And that's something that is changing um, a lot during these times. So um, you can go ahead, dive in. Yeah, it's, uh, it will see as if I was um, mentally preparing myself to a situation like this. But in fact, um, I will say that my pictures, even though they are not staged, uh, they are... Uh, manipulated in terms of how I wait for a very particular moment in which uh, things get uh, a bit uncanny, like uh, nothing is happening, nobody's there. But it's uh, actually it's funny because it will sometimes be a very brief moment. Like I will wait uh, at some point, and like when nobody's there anymore, I take the picture. But <laughs> yeah, I I don't like to portray that particular dimension of uh, the city, uh, which is uh, people per se. Uh, I prefer to focus on this, on, on the city itself, like the city as a, I don't know, like a sculpture park, you know? Sure, and your work does deal a lot with um, the city as a concept and also the architecture specific to Guatemala City, right? Yeah, yeah. and. I think we discussed this uh, before, but um, I'm very drawn to observe uh, and portray architecture because I think it heavily embodies a lot of um, aspects that are important and present in sculpture um, that evoke a lot of interest in me. And I will also say that like many people think that I work primarily with photography but in fact, photography is a way for me to under, understand and decipher forms. Um, I think that in Guatemala City, architecture sometimes behaves in a very organic, like non-premeditated way, um, which seems to respond to the very same, same logic of how I perceive this whole territory, like whole Guatemala behaves like this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like a force of nature manifesting through concrete which I have to say is a predominant material to build things around here. And this uh, leads me to the first image. Like I'm gonna be showing you some images um, that kind of like portray this. Let me see, let me see. Oh. Okay, I think this works. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So yeah, uh, this is something I found, which is uh, just like a, a bit of an abandoned um, structure, you know, but it's like very, very sculptural. Um, and yeah, and there are quite a, quite a lot of things that follow that same um, aesthetic. And one of the concepts that you talk about in your um, artist bio that we have on our website for this event is the concept of the off-modern. Oh, yeah. Um, how yeah, does that relate yeah. to these images? Well, uh, you know, there's, I think there's usually a narrative of 
failure and defeat regarding the current state of things in countries like Guatemala or any other country in Latin America, like saying uh, things as uh, modernity is a failed project, which could be true to some extent, but I prefer to look at it as an ideological agenda that was in part incompatible with, uh, in this case, with the Guatemalan territory or any other territory in Latin America. Uh, therefore, I find this concept of the off-modern as a far more accurate and fair way uh, to think about all this, uh, just as another possible scenario, a different outcome which gives way to other possibilities which I find very valuable and stimulating. Uh, like, for example, this could easily be regarded as a, you know, like as an error or a glitch, I don't know. But uh, I mean, uh, I find it beautiful <laughs> that such things happen because uh, there's not like, um, strong presence of a system that regulates how things manifest in the city or, or this for example and some of these have specific stories to them right rather than yeah, just the some of them um some of them mm, let me find one in particular that i will say that has I think that the story gets deeper when I uh, actually interact with some people, <laughs> which is uh, rarely the case. Um, but yeah, for example, these ones I like very much. Uh, this is something that happens once a year for a fair. It's like a, it's like a fair, um, which they bring these mechanic games and there's uh, like for the vendors all over the place and people and people will go there just to play and hang and eat but it's it's uh it's like a pop up store you know it it just appears uh once a year stays there for a week and they improvise all these structures all these metal structures and cover them with these uh fabrics and decorate them with lights and whatever they can find to decorate them I, I like that very much also. Yeah. Or these things, for example, that uh, this one uh, is, uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's like accessories for bicycles. Uh, there's a guy in the city that's always moving around and I keep finding him in the, the places that I go. But he, he has this uh, thing uh, with, uh, which he uses to offer his uh, products. And yeah, it's, uh, it's very peculiar. And could you also talk about the relationship between your photography practice and your sculpture and video? I know they're very separate, but also have a kind of relationship between them. Oh yes, definitely. Um, for me, photography, it's, uh, it's just like something that comes before uh, a sculpture. It's, it's like, um, it's part of my process of understanding and deciphering all these forms that I will apply later in my sculptures. Um, videos, for example, are more like portraits of the city, um, but they, they all, like there, I think that their final function in my in my work is to help me, yes, understand uh, like all the formal aspects of my environment. Like I will abstract all these uh, aspects and all these formulas and all these strategies to make these things happen. And yeah, they will eventually become a sculpture. And there's one in particular um, that relates to a photo you had that you looked at for a long time um, yes. that a lot of sculptures stem from, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the photos that has like a interesting story. Let me get to it. Um, so yes, I'm gonna put the photo and I'm gonna tell the story. So this, um, when I saw this, I remember thinking Oh, that man carrying a blob looks very peculiar. Uh, it looks as if the blob was not an alien body, but like a part of him. 
so I took my phone out and intended to take a picture of him, but then I thought, um, I shall not develop the bad habit of taking pictures of things that I find mildly curious. So I walked away, but then uh, being already a block away, I turned again, started running to find the guy among the crowd and uh, finally took a photo of him. Um, which afterwards just stood in my, in my phone for like six months and I didn't particularly know what to do with it or why did I find it so compelling. Uh, maybe at the beginning it was simply because it reminded me to this anime character uh, from this uh, very famous movie called Akira. Um, I have the photo here. Yeah, like I, I thought it was just some sort of thing growing out of him. But um, eventually, I thought that this, this could be an interesting portrait of current times. And I mean, not addressing it from a social perspective, but more like this indeterminate form, uh, moving around the city, like this unstructured, non-rigid thing, standing on this very complex, seemingly structured and rigid context, which is the city. So I began doing these uh, hybrids, I would say, half rigid, half malleable, which embodied not only a rational reflection of my experience in the city, uh, wait, but also uh, one that is very sensory and, uh, I don't know, emotional even. And um, can you talk a bit also about the materials for your sculpture and the concrete and mosaic that you use? Oh, yeah. Um, I think the one that uh, has the most uh, materials I use, like the uh, most variety of it, it's this one. Um, as you can see, this one is made uh, out of concrete. It's very heavy. I remember when I um, brought them to the gallery, I. I had to find the help of uh, six guys to, to move it. And they, will, uh, they were a bit uh, struggling with it. But I, I wanted it to be, uh, it was deliberate for it to be this monumental. Like I wanted to have these uh, things that were at the same time very monumental, but uh, had this, uh, like this contrast of, a very, of, a, of an object that it's very soft and and I mean, you could, you could wrap yourself with it. Uh, so the materials in this particular sculpture are uh, mosaic, uh, iron, which is powder coated, and, and concrete. Like, um, almost like, like I wanted to achieve the, the, the same technique that uh, the, Rome, uh, the Roman Empire used, but uh, they, they use volcanic ash for their uh, constructions. And even though there's a lot of volcanic ash here, I couldn't find any. So yeah, I didn't uh, manage to develop my Roman concrete, but yeah, I was pretty happy with the, with the results. And how does that have a relationship to the city of Guatemala City and that idea of modern architecture? Oh, um, I like, uh, let me find this other image. Like this, this is a very uh, correct, like the details uh, that are, um, how to put it, like printed in here, it's, um, it's the wood form. Like I, I didn't make any uh, retouch afterwards. Like I left uh, the, uh, the details of the woodwork as they were. And that's like a very predominant uh, a very predominant um, detail in modern architecture. And we had, we had like a moment of splendor in Guatemala City, which uh, became uh, what is uh, known as Centro Civico, uh, the civic center of Guatemala City. Uh, that was uh, that and some other places in the city, like for example, uh, the public university, which is like the, they call it the uh, Ciudad Universitaria, which is, uh, University City, uh, put it somehow. Um, th th these are places that portray 
like a like a very strong influence of modern architecture and it was led by oh, this I think uh, you modern froze. okay we have you okay and it was uh, this um, modern modernist movement was led by these architects that actually went to study uh, to the to the states and that's where they got in contact with all these ideas of how to develop a modern city but eventually uh, something happened, like things got awry and the, and the project kind of like stopped. And that's what could bring us to this uh, idea and notion that uh, for some reason, this project uh, failed all over Latin America. But that's uh, like the negative uh, reading that I don't like, that I don't particularly like. Maybe it was just, uh, you know, incompatible. And that's that's what I like very much about this idea of the of modern, which is uh, we just we just had this detour that uh, led us here, and it's just another possibility of how things could have turned out uh, out of this modern idea. Yeah, one of the things with these sculptures um, that I think is also very interesting with that specificity of the Centro Civico is um, the use of mosaic, and that there are buildings. Um, I, when we met just before people couldn't travel anymore, and I was in Guatemala City spending a lot of time at the National Theater, mm, which yeah. is completely covered in mosaic. So that relationship yeah. also is very interesting. Yeah, I, um, I like this material a lot because uh, I think it resonates in many different contexts. Like, for example, I'm a, I'm a coder. I work with um, computers and all that. And this may, makes me think of, I don't know, like a stage of rendering or, or like, like it, it has, it embodies this uh, structure and complexity that you would expect from something that, that has to be very precise and rigid as code. But I mean, those are things that influence me and I have in mind when I do these things. But yeah, I, I, I like also this, um, how this element, which has been around humanity for uh, like since uh, the Roman Empire uh, until here, it, aesthetically, it keeps resonating. Like it, it, it's still a valid um, image, to put it somehow. And then the other uh, concept that you mentioned in your bio that guides your work is the interdependence theory. Can you speak about that a little bit as well? Yeah, I, I like, even though I don't particularly portray people, uh, it's, I, I remember reading this uh, preface of this new topographics book in uh, one of the texts that it's at the beginning is uh, an interview. And it's this couple uh, arguing about uh, how, like, one of them will say, these places look so empty, so uh, deprived from human presence. And the other will say, like, you know, even though people are not there, they are really there. Like, this place is the consequence of the interactions of people. Like, this place will not be here if it wasn't for, if it weren't for people. So I like, I like uh, how from the individual to the collective, all these interactions kind of like shape us into something. Like uh, we are, we live in this constant process of becoming uh, us and the city, uh, the places that surround us, uh, they are all the result of this uh, very complex and intricate and close relationships with, with, between all the agents that participate in a given context, like a city. So yeah, I'd like to have that in mind. Yeah, I mean, that's really poignant for our times now also that we're yeah. seeing a lot of empty streets and... Yeah, it's, that's interesting because uh, I've seen a lot of uh, videos and images of uh, animals coming back to urban places. So it's, it's uh, funny because, I mean, there are still some animals living uh, in the city or in the proximities of the city, but they are kind of like becoming another agent. Like, and even, I think for uh, countries like ours, uh, like in Guatemala, it's very evident, like the presence of nature. Like uh, we will even joke about uh, 
throwing seeds into the floor and something will, will grow, will simply grow. It's very easy to grow things here. So nature is very present and nature is affecting us as well. So yeah, I, I like how uh, animals are becoming again, uh, I don't know, like a starring figure in the narrative, narrative of uh, human places. And did you want to talk about what you're working on now or how that's changing? Yes. Um, well, I think it uh, changed uh, in a similar way to all of us. So like we are all on pause somehow. Um, but yeah, let me put the camera back to here. So yeah, I'm gonna begin with this picture because uh, it's it kind of comes from um, like the first uh, association I made of, of these objects was with this uh, and I found it very funny. Um, I'm doing this exploration of these uh, sculpture light objects which are uh, mobile stands like mobile vendor stores. Um, which initially caught my attention because, uh, as I mentioned, I find it funny that the guys carrying them, like the guys that usually carry these uh, mobile stands, look as Roman soldiers going around with these big heavy shields uh, known as scutums. And some others even look as this, uh, and I come to this image, uh, as this military formation called the Studo. And this, uh, I think this was the first photo I took. And I, I also find funny uh, to think of them as shields made of shields because what they usually sell or the ones that I usually notice and uh, uh, grab my attention are uh, they sell phone cases. Um, and it's also even funnier to think how they ended up here. Uh, and I will describe it as uh, these objects manufactured in China, which are accessories to these devices engineered in the United States that are imported to Guatemala City by Arab merchants and that end up being sold in the streets of Guatemala City by, by people that come here to the city to make a living out of it. And that uh, brings, brings us again to this uh, idea of the interdependence. And Another funny thing is that they end up with these uh, stands that are like a template. Um, from where I've talked with them, uh, the vast majority of them go to the same places to get their supplies and order these uh, iron structures from the same blacksmiths and so on. And here are some of the images I've taken of it. And yeah, um, but again, the process here is very similar to what I've been describing during our, our conversation. Um, I, I use photography as a way of, let's say, sketching, uh, deciphering what's going on with a particular thing. And eventually I take these formal aspects and turn them into objects. Uh, and in this case, I want to kind of like replicate these objects, but you know, like in a more uh, abs abstract, uh, formal and structured way. So yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. Well, I, I mean, I'm on pause because uh, <laughs> I cannot get <laughs> supplies. Uh, I cannot go out and get supplies, but yeah. And um, when we talked about this before, you mentioned this uh, phenomenon with these stands also has a relationship with the way the city has changed and how they used to congregate more in Zona Uno, which they're cleaning up, for lack of a better word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there used to be uh, this very crowded avenue, uh, Sixth Avenue, La Sexta, as we know it, which was uh, like, an, like a market, uh, but it was it was like a pop-up market because it appeared every day at 5 a.m. and disappeared every day at 8 p.m. And 
this is this was the place that, uh, in which they usually had uh, like a lot of people had their stands. Eventually, the the mayor and the city hall decided that it it was time to rescue downtown and like to recover the streets and and I don't know clean clean them up as you said. Sure. And they managed to put the vast majority of them into this um, mall like place. But still, there, there are a lot of uh, people that uh, cannot afford or weren't able to get into that deal. So they keep roaming the cities, selling uh, this stuff. And they have to be like, they have to incur in this strategy of uh, being, of having this mobility because eventually a cop will come and just uh, tell them to leave. So they have to move somewhere else and I, I like that also it's like um, I, I think there's like a bit of um, oh yeah maybe it will be too exaggerated to put it this way but like an economic warfare around this so sure, it kind sure. of like keeps resonating with this idea of like them being some sort of army you know And that also relates, we already looked at this work actually, um, but some of the photographic work with those architectural structures um, that are built for specific reasons, like keeping homeless out of a nook or something like that. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the best example I have in the selection I made uh, will be, let me see. Okay, I have, I have two. Yeah, this one uh, actually. Okay, this uh, I have a story for this one. <laughs> I met the guy who lived in in that house um, because that's that's like an ongoing project as well that I want to. Um, like I, I'm, I talk a lot with this uh, anthropologist who, like I I had the idea one day like. You know, uh, I asked him, like, would you be interested in addressing this work from your perspective as an anthropologist? Uh, so I, I will provide, like, we could make a small pub publication and I could provide the images and you could provide, like, the texts, whatever you can come up with. And he kind of, like, suggested making, uh, like, an ethnography of the city, like an ethnography of this um, uh, sculptural manifestations. So we began uh, touring the city, uh, seeing if we could find some extra information uh, related to these uh, things. And we will, we will, we were standing uh, at that place, uh, just looking at this thing. And I kept, kept insisting, like this is a defense. Like uh, this is probably because people come, will come here to urinate, and I don't know. And eventually the, the guy who lived there came by and began looking at us and because we are very um, paranoid in uh, Guatemala City, he will get close and ask like, what do you want? Uh, nothing, we were just contemplating your uh, wall, your defense. Uh, and he was like, oh yeah, this is my room. And being very territorial, but I was like, okay, um, I'm working on this thing. And I showed him some photos and he will get uh, more confident with our presence. And so he began, um, like, I, I will ask him, how did this happen? Like, this is, this is, did you improvise? Because it looks very improvised or what happened? He was like, oh, well, in fact, I had to uh, talk with the city hall for six months to get the permits uh, to build this because uh, this, this corner was a mess. Like they will, uh, I, I almost had like a colony of people living here. And when these people weren't here, they were, uh, there were other uh, non pleasant situations going on there. So he was like, okay, I got the permits and the city hall gave me two days to build it, but uh, I had to run. And when I was at the, at the, like at the middle of, uh, of building it, I ran out of materials. 
So I had to improvise. So now that you will see this ramp here. So it's funny because I, I thought that it was, it was completely improvised, but it's like half and half. Yeah. And I think you said there was another image as well that fits into that. Oh, yeah. Um, this one. I just saw it, but now I don't know what it is. Ah, here. Yeah, this one, um, I think this is a very recurrent uh, thing to appear in the city. That's, that's a corner that clearly was used as a public restroom. So they built this. Yeah. But for that, I don't have a story, but it's uh, like yeah. assuming that. <laughs> More expert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so besides, um, I mean, we've talked about your work, we can talk more, um, but one of the things that we've noticed with a lot of the artists that we've invited, um, I mean, Iglesias Lucan and I, is a lot of you also have curatorial practices or, or are involved with your own art spaces, um, yes. whether that's by coincidence or maybe that's who we know. <laughs> um, so if you want to talk a little bit about um, the construction. I don't know. Uh... I don't know if if that's a content, constant between the artists that uh, have been involved in this project, but I will say that in here, uh, we will also have this uh, cur curatorial practice uh, for the same reason that these structures appear in the city. It's a bit of an improvisation, you know, because uh, our ecosystem of the arts lacks a lot of um, agents that are important to sustain these um, contemporary art practice. So uh, at the lack of uh, curators, I mean, that has changed. I remember when I, uh, well, from what I know, because I'm, I'm relatively young, um, there has been waves of people that become interested in having this uh, curatorial practice, but it, like it comes and goes and I don't know, it. Like nobody wants to take charge of the, you know, like the curatorial aspect of this or like the theory or the critic. Uh, so we kind of like end up doing everything. So yeah, I remember my first steps in this uh, curatorial practice, to put it somehow, were uh, when I got involved in the local art scene which was uh, about 10 years ago after dropping out from high school and not knowing very well what was going on or what will happen. I, I kind of like already knew that I wanted to get involved in some artistic uh, practice or whatever. But given the fact that back in the days there weren't any art schools, and I mean, not that they will take me in uh, given my uneducated condition, um, my education came, came from the acquaintances I made uh, and the books that I could get and having the chance to do some experimentation on, on this. Um, and initially this experimentation happened, and I'm gonna put some more images. This experimentation that I'm talking about took place at a friend's house um, that we turned into um, I don't know, like a small gallery uh, place to do stuff. And we will gather every Friday to show something we have made and we will discuss it, uh, criticize it and all. And that experience had a profound impact in me. Subsequently, I got involved with another exhibition space called Sotano Uno, which was initially founded by one of my artists, Gabriel Rodriguez who also works a lot as a curator. Uh, and we had a nice run for almost five years uh, in which we made a lot of exhibitions. And again, a community was built around it. Um, unfortunately, it came to an end uh, or maybe just a pause, who knows? But it was also a very nice experience. Um, and all, um, 
that year, uh, also, the gallery I was working with uh, closed its doors. So I was already thinking with, with some other artists and friends, uh, which I am, I'm not very sure if they are here, but if you are here, say hi. Um, but we, we discussed that it was probably time to open a gallery that would represent our perspective on things and serve as a hub for our generation to meet. Um, which I see there are many of you uh, watching this live stream. Uh, I, want you, I want you to know that I have, have high hopes on you people, so don't you let me down. Um, so yeah, Riña was born. And before that, uh, La Construcción. Let me see. Um, and I open it. So. Riña. If you want to follow five hours, hours. <laughs> uh, yeah. And before this, um, I began uh, along some other people with this project called like La Construcción, which is, as its name indicates, a construction site which I used as a studio during the process of uh, fabricating the sculptures you've seen already. And yeah, discussing it with. Uh, some of my friends and other co-founders of Riña, we, will, we thought like, why not give this place a go as an exhibition space? So that's my current involvement in this uh, curatorial uh, art uh, space managing thing. And you mentioned also a kind of plan or idea for what's next, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, actually, uh, talking with this guy, uh, I was, I was having this, uh, call with this, uh, artist called, uh, Thomas Geiger, which I invited, uh, once to, like, I, I want to mention this because I think it's important. Um, one thing that I enjoyed a lot, and I mean, like, I enjoyed this a lot, um, doing this, um, art space managing whatever curatorial practice is that it has been an opportunity to establish connections with uh, people outside uh, to establish connections with other people i think that uh, at the center of this uh, one of the, our main motivations is to establish those connections so i thought uh, like instagram has been a very uh, interesting place to meet all these uh, fascinating people that I don't know, uh, I will once uh, give it a try and brought to these guys, uh, these touch guys, and not knowing what way, what uh, will they answer, I just said like, would you like to send something to um, exhibit here? Like this is a construction site. I've noticed that you like construction sites. So would you like to do something? And the guy accepted, uh, Eris Wiggins was my contact in this situation. And yeah, we made this happen. And I made the experiment again and contact Thomas and he also accepted. So yeah, um, it, was a, it was a vehicle to establish these uh, relationships. And yeah, but talking with this, uh, with Thomas, uh, I remember that I had this project, which uh, I was going to call The Artist is Online, um, which uh, initially was a reaction to Marina Abramovic's uh, The Artist is Present, uh, which I know is a bit of an old joke. But yeah, the original idea was uh, to have me just hanging around uh, in front of the camera, you know, like staring at people. But then I thought, given the current circumstances, it will be far more interesting if it became like a platform to invite artists to be online, like we are right now, and just hang with people. So yeah, uh, that's pretty much about it. Um, so I think we can open it up to questions for those of you who are watching, if you want to. Um ask anything, go ahead and type up your questions. 
Um, but in the meantime, if nobody has questions, I have some more. Um, okay. You did mention this, but I am curious about your relationship with being a practicing artist and also that you're a computer coder and that you're mm -hmm. self-taught in both uh, and how that informs your practice as an artist. Yeah. Well, uh, at the beginning, I was more into um, developing artwork that had this uh, uh, facet, this aspect of my life in it. Uh, and I, I actually uh, participated in the Pais Biennial, which is the Guatemalan Biennial, with, um, it, was a, it was some sort of uh, role-playing game, I will describe it, uh, like a bit of a, like uh, something before the notion, the current notion we have of augmented reality, but some, somewhere along that line. Uh, it was this game, uh, you will download this app and you will be asked to select a role. Uh, and there was a list of roles which were stereotypes and I don't know, like the characters of Guatemalan society. You had to choose which one you were. And then you had to choose uh, which one of the rest were your allies and your enemies and just uh, put start and start moving around. And this uh, thing will never indicate where the actual location of people uh, was. It will, it will just indicate that you had um, enemies or allies or an ally or an enemy or no one around. So I, I made that to play with this notion of like, like to fic fictionalize this uh, relationship with, we have with people, like we just uh, kind of like invent who the other is without uh, really knowing the story behind. But yeah, and I think it's uh, particularly exacerbated in a society like this in which we are very distrustful of each other. I mean, once you, once you get into someone's life, uh, I think that uh, Guatemalan could be a very good ally but before trespassing that barrier, we are very like reluctant to many things. But yeah, that, that uh, I saw um, this um, digital platform as a way to abstract this uh, phenomenon and make it a game. Sure. Yeah. We do have questions now. Um, what creative factors has Les Avenida provided to you as an artist and creator? Uh, I remember, like, okay, La Sexta, as it was, disappeared almost 10 years ago. And I remember that I, when I was uh, uh, younger, I didn't like it that much. But, uh, you know, I have this... Like I have this love-hate relationship with this city. Um, even though there are many things that I don't like, I think that I like that I don't like them, you know? And uh, like, I find that stimulating. Like, uh, I will not say that I live in this uh, constant comfort of like, I find, I find the city comfortable, not at all. But uh, I don't know, that keeps me, keeps me awake. So La Sexta is one of those places that even though has changed from that original form of uh, street sales and everything, it's still very chaotic. Uh, it's still a place that has undergone a lot of uh, real estate speculation and I don't know what, uh, what could be regarded as gentrification. But still is La Sexta. I mean, down, downtown will always be downtown, even when the speculation ends, uh, the chaos will remain. And yeah, I, I, that, that, that ritualistic approach that people had in La Sexta of uh, building everything and unbuilding it every day, that's, that, that's a thing that kept in my mind. And I enjoyed very much how they made their structures. Uh, and it was also a template. Like I, I, I imagine they had uh, quite a few providers 
some blacksmiths that will make all these structures. And I actually, um, I mean, those ideas that you say eventually will happen, but I, I want to make some sort of, um, what's the name of this game? Uh, um, Minecraft? I, I, I just found it so um, old. <laughs> yeah, Minecraft. Not, not my area of expertise. Yeah, I want, I want to make some sort of uh, Minecraft, uh, the, the same principle of uh, building blocks, but with these uh, structures that they used in La Sexta. That, that's another thing that inspired me. Yeah. And there was another question, I don't know how serious it was, about the future of artistic uh, our, production in Guatemala. Oh, yeah. We, we, all are, we, are we doomed? <laughs> yeah, the, um, yeah, actually, Juan, Juan that is there, um, he has quite a, he, he made a, he, he along uh, Byron Marmol, they made a portrait of uh, La Sexta, uh, Sexta oh, Niscazzi, okay. if you want to look for it. But yeah, you, you know very well, Juan, that we are doomed. <laughs> <laughs> and then we see a lot of the same art influenced by pedagogical structure. And do you find that there's more authenticity in Guatemalan art worlds or maybe less saturation or more opportunity? Um, well, interesting it's question. interesting because um, I, I noticed something that's very particular of our art scene. And that is the fact that even though uh, our intentions as artists, I mean, uh, being more in this uh, contemporary part of uh, his, art history, I think that one of the paradigms of uh, this contemporary production is to establish this uh, like global dialogue and uh, to establish this dialogue with the world. But Guatemalans seem to enjoy very much living in, uh, you know, in Guatemala, like, um, I don't know, uh, you, can, you can never escape from the idea of being a Guatemalan. Like, for what I have, uh, uh, I like to understand that from the fact of our topography, I think. I, there are two key factors that I'd like to use to understand our behavior. Um, and I will begin by saying that I think we are mountain people and we behave like mountain people. Like, we don't like... We don't like, we are always surprised by uh, discovering that there was someone else living on the other side of the mountain. It's, I mean, and we are like deers uh, um, getting afraid by foreigners visiting our territory. But yeah, like, I think there's that isolation, to put it somehow, gives us a bit of an authenticity. But at the same time, we are heavily influenced by uh, all the things that uh, have been going on here since, I don't know, at least 500 years. First the Spaniards, then the States. So yeah, we are, we are, a, we are a weird mixture of influences, but th that also get transformed by something that's very unique to us, like very authentic. Um, I think that even with all the influence, all the external influence, there's still like a very deep and heavy voice. I don't know, like, uh, I, I will even describe it as some sort of message emanating from somewhere in this territory that reminds us that we are from here and that we are these, uh, yeah, these, these creatures from here. Um, and about the saturation opportunity, well, uh, you can do whatever you want to do here. That's, uh, that's an opportunity. Nobody will stop you if you want to transform a construction site to make it an art space. Even, even uh, when people could die by uh, give, uh, taking a bad step. Nobody will stop you. That's, uh, I think that's, um, I see it as an opportunity. But at the same time, uh, this isolation and lack of structures and lack of a, like a far more um, rich ecosystem has a lot of drawbacks. Uh, and that's what I mentioned of waves. Like you will see waves, like 
suddenly it seems like something's gonna happen. Like, oh, okay, we are on a, we are on, we have momentum. Something's gonna happen now, and eventually everything closes, and you have to start all over again. But uh, I hope that uh, my generation will contribute to change that. So yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of questions on this route. Um, one about whether Guatemala can become a strong player in the art world. I don't know that it's a weak player. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, I mean, um. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's complex. It's complex because uh, the world seems to be very fixed to put it somehow, uh, like you will see it in economy, you will see it in politics. Sometimes, even if you don't want to be like a conspirationist, uh, conspirationist, you will get the sense that the world is very fixed and it's, it's kind of like difficult to have that. But I keep insisting in Guatemala, for example, I mean, a lot of people uh, has moved from Guatemala and a lot of them have said to me like stop uh, wasting your time in Guatemala and move over here or do something else but uh, in the meantime I, I, I want to insist a bit more in this I think that Guatemala provides you a very interesting mental scape you know like a very interesting mindset um, I, I think that all the things that I know and make me competitive uh, to some extent at a global uh, range uh, come from the fact that I was uh, born and raised in this country. So I, I will always joke about uh, being in Guatemala is like playing in nightmare mode. Like, you know, like playing Doom in nightmare mode. Like if you manage to survive that, then you are unstoppable. And I, I know quite a few Guatemalans that kind of like seem like that like they are already unstoppable we'll see only time will tell but yeah even even if it's uh, a, uh like a myth i'm building i like to i i will bet in this uh idea that a watermelon can become a strong player in the art world in the coming years especially now that world seems to be shifting towards something else um we'll see and we have a question from Aime Iglesias Lucan, who's our gallery director, asking uh, what some of the artists you most admire or identify with are. Yes. Um, let me see after what question was that? Because I see one. I see one um, after Corso that says, Do you think Guatemala should lead other independent art spaces in Central America? Do you think Guatemala in contemporary art is leading Central American art? Well, uh, and this might be a bit uh, polemic to say, but I think I think it always responds to the scale of your country, unfortunately. Um, I think that there are interesting things in the most unexpected places. That, that's one thing I like Guatemala. Like, uh, Guatemala is one of the best kept secrets of the region as a country. Like, uh, if you ask someone from the Northern Hemisphere where Guatemala is, they will say, like, Africa or something. So Guatemala is like a secret, and I think that its art scene is a secret within a secret. And it's quite unexpected. Like, people will come here and, wow, do you have this strong contemporary art scene? Like, and, yeah, we do. So I think that can happen everywhere. But due to our history, uh, we might have a certain advantage in this um, contemporary art uh, scene thing. Compared with other Central American countries. Yeah. yeah. But I think we are at the, at the same time. Well, Costa Rica, for example, has a very strong art scene. And I think they have, at, in, in terms of its ecosystem, it's far more um, complete that, than ours. Like it had some, like they actually reached a point in which they develop uh, uh, institutions that support contemporary art. And we don't have them here. So at an institutional level, I think that Costa Rica is, uh, has a very strong um, presence. Um, 
El Salvador. It, it's a very interesting country as well now. It has a very strong art scene. And I, I want to point this uh, about um, the idiosyncrasies of Guatemalans. Uh, I've noticed uh, whether it's, it's a strategy or something that's more um, cultural related, we don't, we are not very good at establishing alliances. Whereas uh, Salvadorians seem to be very into that. Like Salvadorians will come to Guatemala and they will try to establish a relationship with us. Uh, and it's, it's, they have a very strong art scene now because of that, um, because they are constantly trying to establish these, these relationships with the, with the world, you know? And we, we don't do it uh, with that much uh, efficiency. So I think there are many, uh, it's, it's arguable in what way we could be leading. Maybe, yeah, maybe our history goes uh, way back and that already provides an, a, a backbone, like a aesthetic backbone, a cultural backbone that permeates every one of us. But yeah, I think there are many things happening in Central America. And we'll be cut in just four minutes if you want to answer the question about um, what are some of the artists you most admire and identify with? Oh, well, uh, I will say one of the first artists I met uh, in, uh, 10 years ago was Dario Escobar. Uh, he's someone I admire very much and he was the founder of the 999 Gallery, the gallery that represented me for some years. Um, my Rinya mates, I respect them and I do what I do with them because I, I respect them and value what they do, uh, which are Andres Vargas, Luis Ponce, Byron Marmol, um, also Juan Brenner, which was a uh, writing order. It's, uh, I think it's impressive what he has accomplished. And me being, to, like he even said once, like you are more photographer than you think you are. <laughs> even though I, I just described it as a way to achieve something else. But yeah, in terms of contemporary photography, I think that Juan has uh, paved the way uh, for many of us. And uh, his book, uh, the one that he recently published, uh, was like the revelation uh, recently. Um, yeah. And do you have any closing words? We'll, we have just a couple more minutes before we're cut off. Um, I don't know. Um, I think I talked a lot already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, know. well, thank you so much for joining us. And um, everybody, please go follow Rinya, follow Diego's Instagram. <laughs> um, and some, she, some shameless self -promotion. What's next? Sure, why not? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you for watching. Bye.